humans are building artificial intelligence and yet we burn coal to stay warm, much as we did 200 years ago. We talked to Seb Henbest to understand for how much longer. Seb, welcome to Raw Talks. Thank you. Let's park the climate change argument for a moment. Compared to the level of sophistication that uh, we've achieved in so many aspects of our existence, there's something deeply contradictory um, about our rely on reliance on burning fossil fuels. Why is this energy transition taking so long? Well, I think you've got to have a better alternative before you can transition away from the old. Uh, and I think the old is been very, very good for humanity. You know, we have developed as a species um, in, in such a rapid way over the last 150 years uh, that uh, we are now in a position where we can start to be worried about things like climate change and we can start to be worried about um, things like air pollution. Um, but overall, you've got to find new technologies that can do what the old can do and that takes time. And you know, you need to spur those technologies on um, and develop them from R&D all the way through to commercialization and deployment. Um, and so we're now seeing the end part of that transition. We now have mature, deployable alternatives to fossil fuels. And increasingly as we go forward, they're going to become cheaper, we think, and more attractive. Uh, and as a result, this transition is only going to accelerate from here. We're just at the beginning of it uh, now. Um, and watch this space. Petrol for cars, that has been central to the energy debate for, for century. But the transport sector, in fact, accounts for a fraction of total energy consumption. Could you dissect the structure uh, for us? When you think about energy, there's two big, well, three big players, electricity, transport and heat. Um, and in terms of the changes that we've seen, it's, it's all been at the electricity uh, sector thus far. Um, in any deployable scale, and in terms of disruption, um, that's really been the story. Increasingly, we're seeing the transport sector uh, start to look forward and see disruption over the hill. Um, and uh, there's some very important developments on the technology side that s whose day seems to have come. I mean, the electric vehicles, uh, you know, they were first uh, deployed in some you know, volume almost 100 years ago. And they took a long time to gather momentum um, for all sorts of interesting political and, and uh, uh, industrial reasons. But now we have battery technology that is increasingly cheap, that is being scaled up, that's super important for technology cost declines, that's going into these vehicles and is going to be increasingly disruptive uh, for the oil and gas sector, it, which is particularly the oil sector, has sort of seen no competitors. I mean, the energy density of, of, of oil products is high enough that it's been very hard to, to match it. And in many cases, you know, the electrification of transport isn't going to get all the way there, uh, potentially. But electric vehicles now are the centre point of so many manufacturer strategies, um, not just government plans, but manufacturer strategies that make it increasingly more likely that this is going to be some great tension in the future between the oil and gas sector and the uh, automotive sector, because they can't both be right in terms of their future outlook. In the other sectors, uh, what, what do we see, what kind of change will we see in energy um, demand? When we look at this from an electricity perspective, you can kind of break the world into two. You've got the developed economies that are flat and stalling in terms of electricity, uh, electricity demand growth, transport is still growing, and you've got the developing world which is growing very quickly. And so the big opportunities of the future in many ways um, are going to be there, and in particular Asia Pacific, so developing Asia, again looking at electricity is as much uh, activity and investment as the rest of the world combined we think out to 2040. So that's sort of the hub of huge amounts of capacity being added, huge amounts of, um, of investment uh, finding their way uh, you know, to new um, uh, power generating infrastructure, grids, but also things like charging infrastructure for, uh, for, for electric vehicles. Let's move into current developments and look at electricity first. Uh, coal is king, but the cheapest uh, fuel is also the biggest CO2 pollutant. However, a recent report of yours claimed that the end of coal is approaching and that because the cost of wind solar is plummeting faster than previously thought. Tell us the full story. 
Well, firstly, that coal doesn't disappear, but it gets outcompeted increasingly. Um, and that, as you said, is because we've got technology alternatives that can do it cheaper and do it more flexibly and can be deployed much faster and don't have the supply side um, constraints of moving fuels around. Um, so I think the, in a nutshell, the new energy outlook, which is our long term forecast of 2040, looks at the economics and we strip out policy and politics and and some of the mess that we all have to live in at the moment. And then we look at extracting crossover points between these technologies like wind and solar that are coming down in price very, very quickly. And the more conventional technologies that are more mature and, and more stagnant in their, in their pricing structure. And we can extract two tipping points. The first is when does wind and solar get cheaper than coal and gas? Um, and in someone like Germany today, that's already happened, but is still likely to happen, we think almost everywhere by the early 2020s. And the second tipping point is when new build solar and wind gets cheaper than the coal and gas that's already out there in the field, that's fully amortised, that is just running on fuel prices. Uh, and we think by 2030 that's happening in China, that's happening in um, US, that's happening um, in Germany. Um, and as a result, it becomes increasingly obvious that the system should be uh, focused around these very cheap renewable technologies where the fossil fuel components play a balancing role uh, in fitting it together. Something that a lot of people wonder about when it comes to wind and solar is if they can ever deliver the volume or scale that is required. Right, I mean, it's an important question is what can these technologies do? Um, they're very different to the technologies we've had in the past. I mean, we think about power generation in particular here. Um, you know, we're used to very large generating facilities connected through large transmission lines to demand centres. And they've often had the involvement of government, the involvement of sort of big finance and big utilities who have either the balance sheet, the expertise or both to help get these projects built. And now we're seeing the rise of renewable technology, which unit by unit is much smaller um, in general. Uh, you know, you're talking gigawatt scale for a large coal or nuclear facility. Um, you're talking hundreds of megawatts of maximum for a PV facility. Wind can be a little bit bigger, but still, you know, they're, they're, they're not an order of magnitude smaller all the time, but they're close. Um, and the question then is, who can this deliver at scale? Well, I don't think that's an impediment. And in fact, that offers new flexibility in a system which we think is going to get increasingly distributed. Um, the more places you can deploy these technologies, and of course solar is everywhere to an extent, it changes with latitude, so the quality gets, you know, gets worse as you get towards the poles, but wind is not everywhere, but it's in a lot of different places. How do you map that together to provide supply to demand centres over time? The big question on this is what if the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining? And that's a great question. Today, that's not a problem in almost everywhere. There are a couple of examples because the penetration's too low. But after a certain point, you do have this issue. How do you manage to move supply over time? How do you store it? And also, how do you move demand? Because demand, there's no reason demand should be so dumb, right? We have enough information now coming through smart meters to better optimize how we use electricity, which is cheaper for me, the consumer, and cheaper for the grid and cheaper for society. Um, often not so good for energy utilities who have to sell volume, but uh, we think the future is going to be a much more complex mapping of supply and demand uh, as a result. The other big fossil fuel is of course oil, uh, key to uh, power vehicles. Now with low oil price seemingly here to stay, is there sufficient incentive to consolidate alternative uh, energy sources? Low oil prices generally make internal combustion engines more competitive than alternatives and the big challenge with the transport sector um, and new technologies and whether they can play a role is how competitive can they be and how quickly can they be competitive. Right now, they're not. Uh, you need government programs to help push uh, volume into, into those markets to create demand. Um, and we've seen you know, quite a lot of penetration when that happens. People are not afraid of the technology. There was a lot of worry for a while that you know, electric vehicles would be uh, a concern because of their range and they were new and would they sell. I think the answer is quite clearly that they're, in general, a better product. They're a computer with wheels, and that offers a huge number of opportunities um, uh, for transport services in the future. But um, the question, you know, when are they cost competitive, and does the price of oil matter? And the answer is yes, of course it matters, but probably a little bit less than everyone would like to think. 
And the reason is that the cost comparison between a electric vehicle and an internal combustion engine vehicle in many ways is driven by the cost of the battery. It is the dominant part of electric vehicles, about a third, give or take, of the, of the capex of an electric vehicle. And those batteries are coming down in price dramatically. So we can track that and we track the prices in the market and we can see that since 2010 the price of a lithium ion battery has come down 73%. It's now $273 a kilowatt hour uh, for about a thousand then. Um, and we look at the volume of manufacturing coming online and we know that technologies get cheaper as manufacturing volumes go up. Uh, whether it's Elon Musk in Nevada or it's um, BYD in China or LG Chem in Korea, the expansion plans are phenomenal. The volume of manufacturing coming online, we, it's more than going to more than double by 2020 and then a factor of 10 up again um, from today by 2030. Now all that volume pulls prices down. So we can then track that forward and see how the price of an electric vehicle uh, might compete. If you just look at the sticker price you'd see in the dealer, then by, on average, 2025, later for small cars, but earlier for larger cars, it's as cheap as an internal combustion engine. And at that point, you start, you're going to start to see dramatic organic uptake. Governments aren't important. There's a big gap in the middle, though. Um, and when we map this forward to 2040, you don't have 100% electric vehicles on the road. Uh, because it takes a long time for the fleet to turn over and there are lots of applications where people don't want to make that decision and in parts of the world uh, you know it might still be very expensive to charge your car or whatever it happens to be. Um, so we get to about 45 percent of new vehicles by 2040. A significant chapter in this energy transition story will be our ability to store the electricity and hence the capacity of batteries will be crucial. Um, how are we doing? What we're seeing is this symbiosis between electric vehicles and grid storage or battery storage. And that makes us somewhat confident that lithium ion batteries in particular are going to play an important role because they have this advantage of their cost declines being driven by a completely different industry for completely different reasons. Um, so those bat battery cost declines are going to play into the stationary storage market. Lithium ion batteries are really good at getting to a peak really fast. Now where they're not good at is long duration. So batteries, uh, lithium ion batteries, enjoying the cost declines associated with electric vehicles are going to play an important role in helping balance the short term to the intraday. They may play some role a little bit longer, but it gets expensive. You need a really big battery to discharge over a long period of time. When we get to high penetrations, you've still got a seasonal problem. So if you wanted to go all renewable, the question is, well, how do you generate to meet your evening winter peak, say here in the UK, uh, when it's not windy and there's no solar? Uh, and it's been like that for three or four days and it's winter. Now that's a big challenge. It's not at us yet. Uh, and there are a number of technologies that help deliver that. Um, but uh, I think our expectation is that engineers are good at solving problems. And this is essentially an engineering problem. And finally, let's look into the future. What is the global energy sector going to look like in 30 years from now? Simple question. Simple question. Um, and I wouldn't like to take any long-term bets on this because there's a lot of things changing. But our view is that by you know, 2040 plus, you're going to see a system that is dominated by renewable technologies, particularly wind and solar, making up two-thirds of capacity with fossil fuels sort of filling in the gaps. You're going to see a system that's increasingly distributed. So consumers are playing a much bigger role. Maybe they're trading peer-to-peer. -peer. Maybe they're being aggregated up and being traded in the market. Um, as well, or maybe they just happen to own battery in a PV system. Um, I think we're going to see a system where transportation is increasingly electric and it's going to become a bit old-fashioned to have an internal combustion engine um, and people are increasingly going to want the new model of the electric one um, and it's going to become affordable and likely to be the cheapest thing uh, that you can buy. Um, so I think that this energy system is on the cusp of dramatic change uh, the renewable technologies that are going to facilitate that are mature or are maturing at a rate at which you can see these crossovers in their economics happening They're much earlier than we anticipated even a year ago. And I think that offers huge challenges for the incumbent industries and great opportunities for new industries and new players to become part of the energy system of the future. And with that, our time is up. Thank you very much for joining Rotox. Thanks very much. And to keep up with the new debate on extractives and development, Join us at wartalks.org.